Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Abba, Father. Praise the Lord. He says that's the way he wants us to refer to him. That's like Daddy. Amen. You know, he wants that kind of intimacy with us. And praise the Lord. What a good God. Amen. Thank the Lord. Give the Lord a big hand clap this morning. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Tim. Great job as always. Thanks, Suzanne, Tammy, and all the young worshipers. Praise the Lord. And thank you, Mike, for doing about 800 things out there at once. Praise God. And the Sunday school kids can go downstairs. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God is good. A lot of people out of town, when we're aware of some of that, and uh, different events, high school uh, singing groups are in Iowa City, and uh, so there's families out for that. But God is good. Amen. And he said, wherever two or more would gather together, he's there in the midst of us. Praise the Lord. So, glory to God. Now, I think... I, uh, I think we take the English language for granted. I mean, it's full of paradoxes. Uh, quicksand takes you down slowly. Boxing rings are square. And a guinea pig is neither from Guinea nor is it a pig. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So is it any wonder we, you know, we wonder why uh, people from other countries come here and uh, have to learn this language? I'm telling you. If you didn't grow up with all of these weird little kind of paradoxes, I don't know how anybody could learn the language and make any sense out of it. It's just crazy. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But anyway, I went to the hardware yesterday. Uh, it's, you know, this time of year is so weird because it's, you know, it's cool at night, cold at night. Then it kind of warms back up during the day, especially if there's any sun. And it just attracts the bugs to the house. So if there's any solid thing where the sun can shine on it, they're going to get on that to try to get warm. It's just box elder bugs out here on the... Uh, front doors into the entryway here. They're just thick on there. And uh, so I went to the hardware to get some wasp spray and I asked the guy at the counter, I said, is this stuff good for wasp? And he said, no, it kills them. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> you know what cheese can never be yours? Nacho cheese. Nacho cheese. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I struggle with uh, Roman numerals, at least until I get to 159, and then it just kind of clicks. 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 You'll have to go back through your Roman numerals there, praise the Lord. Uh, I have a stepson that does taxidermy. In fact, I went out to eat with a taxidermist once, and I was stuffed afterwards. <laughs> That's about all anybody can bear in one sitting. Praise the Lord. I do appreciate all the, the worship songs because they do point directly to what I feel like the Lord wants me to talk about this morning. And so with that in mind, let's go begin with John uh, chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. John 3, 16 through 18. Praise the Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his own Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 uh, verses 9 and 10. He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. And last, let's do Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14.
giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Praise the Lord. So if you can kind of keep those in your mind for a moment, I want to say something that I had forgotten to mention. And that is that uh, Yvette uh, doesn't drive. She rides with uh, Debbie uh, to come to church. And Debbie's going to be out of town for a couple of weeks, and we'd like somebody, if possible, to pick De uh, Yvette up and bring her to church for the next couple of weeks. In fact, if you would just check with uh, Yvette or Debbie, they can tell you the, the dates and the address and all of that kind of stuff, and I hope that somebody can step up and, and make it possible for her. I hate to have her have to miss church uh, because Debbie's out on a gad. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, because Debbie has other obligations, amen. And, uh, she, you know, she wants to make sure that her friend is able to be in church. And, of course, Yvette wants to be here, and we want her to be here. So if anybody can step up, please talk to them, uh, and uh, they'll give you the details and the information you need, okay? All right, praise the Lord. So, now, having uh, read these scriptures, have you ever, have you ever wondered what, what's more evil? What's more sinful? You know, what's more wicked? being blind and living in ignorance or knowing what's right and still doing what's wrong. And a hush fell over the room, praise the Lord. Well, when Jesus went to the cross, he saw everything that we'd ever be. He saw everything we'll ever do and all that we would ever want that would be outside of him. And yet he gladly came and got us. He looked down and he said about each one of us, I want that one. Praise the Lord. We couldn't earn it. We don't deserve it. But he freely loves us and gives us his grace. I don't think we comprehend sometimes what a tremendous gift this is that he's provided for us. And at what cost. Not only didn't we deserve his love, but we deserved the opposite. But he let his beauty and goodness pour out of him into our ugliness and our evil. It's really only when we realize just how inadequate we are, how incapable we are of freeing ourselves from sin, that we understand grace is not nice. Grace is not cute. Grace is not some just warm, fuzzy feeling. Grace is outrageous. Grace is extreme love, love that most of us never really are able or capable of expressing. It doesn't wait on the outside. It doesn't stand back and look at the mess and say, well, wait till this calms down and gets straightened out. Amen. It enters right into our struggles. It enters right into our messes. Amen. We don't have to hide the fact that we're messy. Praise the Lord. I like Tim's always saying, you know, I don't why people pull the shades. I mean, you're going to do something that you shouldn't do. And the only one that really matters knows about it anyway, whether the shades are pulled, the lights are on or off, or anything else, you know. But God doesn't hide the fact that he realizes how messy we are, how messed up we are. He doesn't, he doesn't, he isn't bothered by it. He isn't traumatized by it. Because that's exactly the kind of people that he came for. That's exactly who he's wanting to reach. Amen. God doesn't hide sin. In fact, he put it on display 2,000 years ago on the cross. He became sin for us. God didn't hide it. He made a panoramic view for the whole world to see sin in the person of his own son. Praise the Lord. Jesus came down to earth and he lived the perfect life, the life that none of us could ever live. Amen. He died the death that every one of us should have died. And every drop of blood that poured from him was another drop of God's love falling on us. Have you ever felt like your sin needs to be dealt with? That, you know, like it, this needs to be paid for. This last behavior, this last got ticked off at somebody and said something you shouldn't have. Or you just had these really bad feelings or you did this or said that or whatever. And feel like, man, that needs to be dealt with. That, that needs to be taken care of. It has been. Praise the Lord. All our sins, all our filth, all our guilt, all our shame, Jesus paid the price on our behalf. Amen. For everything that's ever happened, 
for everything that is happening and for anything that may happen in the future. It's all been dealt with. That type of grace is dangerous. I mean, if you think about it on a human level, I mean, just look somebody right straight in the eye and say, forgive it. No matter what it was, no matter what it is, no matter what it might be, it's just taken care of. It's okay. No conditions, no contract to sign, just you get a pass. I forgive you. That's dangerous. In human relationships, that can be dangerous, praise the Lord. Amen. That type of grace, when it's really understood, turns everything upside down. It changes everything. That's the type of grace that allowed 12 weak, ordinary failures, untrained, unlearned, to turn the world upside down 2,000 years ago. People just like us. People with all the same flaws, all the same failures and weaknesses. That's the grace that Jesus brought. Amen. And it's available for everybody. John 8, uh, verse 32. And you'll know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I know sometimes you think, you may be thinking, God, here we go again. What is he, can he just get off this grace thing for a little bit? And I'm, I'm telling you, for some reason, the only way for spiritual growth, I'm talking about real spiritual growth, not just information or knowledge, but I'm talking about real spiritual growth, is having this truth constantly beaten into our heads. Amen? Romans 4, verses 4 and 5. I get phone calls all during the week, sometimes meet with people, and even if I didn't do that, I'd still have to deal with me. I know we need this. I know everybody needs this. Amen? And we need it desperately if we're ever going to be the body that Jesus intends us to be. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I appreciate the testimonies. I appreciate the, the prophetic words about our government, and I agree. But I also think that my problem is not the guy in the White House. Amen? My problem is my focus on who's on the throne. He can take care of the stuff that's in the White House. He can take care of what's going on in Congress and the Senate. But if my focus is on that instead of on him, I'm missing it because I can't change these people. I mean, come on. How, many, how, how, y'all, long, how long y'all been voting and, and not getting what you voted for? Right? I mean, is it not the person? It's the system. So, and I'm not saying everybody's perfect that's in the system either, but I'm just saying they're just, hum- they're just people. God can handle that. He can handle the government. And our, our attention needs to be on Him. Amen. And praying for those who are in power and have authority over us so that God can get the people in there that will hear His voice, that will respond to Him. Because obviously they're not responding to us. They make the promises, but they can't back them up. They may really mean the promises they make, but even today at my age, I look and I, and I hear the promises and I think, oh boy, here we go again. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how many elections I've been through. I'm 71, so over 50 years of voting, because back when I was first voted, you had to be 21. And uh, I've seen very little accomplished, I mean, long term, by anybody. Some have better intentions than others. But the outcomes are usually the same, and that is they get what they want, and which is to be reelected, and then they don't worry about us. Praise the Lord. We have to figure it out for ourselves. God is looking out for us. I love this country. I mean, I fought for it. I was Vietnam, uh, Marine Corps, flag-waving, John Wayne-loving American. You know what I'm saying? But I'm not naive either. We've got our problems just like everybody else does. And it's because we have people. And people are a mess without Jesus. The best of us are a mess without him. Amen? So, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now look at this. And Ron, I hope you don't misunderstand me. I, I, I believe in the prophetic. 
And I believe what that, what that prophetic word is saying is what we're talking about. That we're believing for something different, for a new thing to happen, amen, in Washington. And I don't care who's in the White House, God can do this, amen, because only God can do it, amen. And that's why I receive that word with faith, amen, believing that that's exactly what God is doing, amen, in the realm that we cannot see yet. That has to be manifest. Amen. So now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now that is, I mean, that's like a slap on the back of the head. Like, whoa, wake up. What is this all about? Amen. He says that God justifies the ungodly. I mean, do you believe in a God who justifies ungodly people? It's a contradiction. Talk about the English language being filled with, with uh, paradoxes. That's a paradox to a human being, to a natural person, because you think, hey, there's only one way I can be better, and that's to be better, you know, to get better, to be a better person, to try. And we ought to do that. But the problem is you can't do it. You can try, but you can't accomplish it. Amen. He says, God justifies the ungodly. Praise God. I mean, really? Not the people who have it all together? Not the people who are good enough? Not the people who try really hard? Nope. The ungodly ones. And thank God, because I'm in that number. Praise the Lord. God makes right the ones who aren't right. He makes holy the filthy. He purifies the impure. He calls the wicked blameless. He justifies the ungodly. I'm talking about, you talk about a good God, we're singing the song, we have no concept of his goodness. I mean, we just, it, it's beyond human comprehension. That's why it, hey, we have to do it by faith. Amen? Amen? Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 through 9. Oh, man. I mean, the Lord wants this world to be free. You know how many people are going around guilty and ashamed and, and condemned? And, and if it isn't somebody else condemning them, they're condemning themselves. And if it isn't themselves condemning, they can go to church and find quickly they can find condemnation there. When all the time, all God's wanting to do is love them, even in their ungodliness. He doesn't want them to stay that way. But how are you ever going to change if you can't be accepted, if you can't enter into some kind of a relationship with God that makes you feel accepted, that makes you feel valued and have worth? Most of the problems that crime and everything else we have in this country is because of people who are devalued, who have no sense of self-worth, and it, it all becomes about uh, the biggest dog eats and everybody else goes hungry. And God wants to feed all of us. Amen. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eye and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where are you? Now, God didn't need Adam to answer to know where he was, but Adam and Eve had just pulled the shades. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And God knew it. And he wasn't trying to get them to confess something. He was trying to get them to understand something. They had just given up the freedom, the peace, and the love and the grace of God for an understanding of good and evil. Amen? Now they become their own God, judging what is right and what is wrong. That's the world we live in, folks. And I don't care who's in charge. Everybody gets to pick what's good and what's bad. So that can change from moment to moment, from person to person. But with God, there's one constant. And that's he's good, and his grace is sufficient for every failure that we have. Amen? It's, it's interesting that uh, 
when we uh, when we feel ungodly, we have a tendency to hide, to try to cover it up, to, to pretend like it's not me or it's not this or it's not that or the other thing. Let's go to Romans chapter 4, verses 5 through 8. We tried to lock them down and keep them down there, but they keep getting out. <laughs> but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Saying, blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So, God doesn't uh, hide in this verse. He boasts that he makes right the people who don't deserve his righteousness. Amen? He's bragging about his making right those who deserve the opposite. This is God talking. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word is God. Amen? He's revealing Himself, His personality, His, his character, His reality through His own Word. So it's, it's, it's strange, you know, in, in a weird way it seems that the only way to qualify for justification is to actually be ungodly. Somebody ought to say praise the Lord. Amen? Glory to God. It's like God saying... You got, if you're going to qualify, you have to admit you don't qualify. Amen. Amen. Again, it's, it's this paradox. It's, it's a contradiction almost in natural thinking. That's why our minds have to be renewed to the Word of God because God doesn't think the way humans think. He wants us to think the way He thinks. Amen. Grace comes to the person who doesn't work. Praise the Lord. Now, I'm not saying working's a bad thing, because it's not. I mean, discipline isn't a bad thing. It, th those are good things. But if we're working to earn salvation, it becomes a horrible thing. Discipline's good. Effort's good. But not if it's you trying to make something happen as far as your salvation by doing some certain act or behavior. Amen? It doesn't work that way. Look at Ephesians Chapter 2, verses 6 through 9. I can tell you this. There are people that are, not, that are not in church today, not because they don't believe in God, but because they don't believe how good God is. They've been convinced that he's just this angry ogre waiting to slap them down and take them out when it's just the complete opposite of this. He has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So you can't earn God's favor no matter how hard you try. No matter how hard you work at it, you're always going to come up short. It's not possible. If it were possible, then there would have been no reason for him to come in the flesh. There would have been no reason for Jesus to come and live a perfect life and die on the cross. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now remember, Jesus is talking to Jews. He's talking to the most religious people on the planet. And that's what their religion is. Work. Effort. Amen? And he's saying, come to me. I know you're, you're laboring, and if you're honest with yourself, you know you're always coming up short. If, they weren't, if that weren't the case, they wouldn't have had the animal sacrifices. Amen? And they didn't do away with sin. They just covered it for, from year to year. Amen? And he's telling these people, he's saying, come to me. All you that are doing all this work and, 
and I'm going to give you rest. I'm going to let you relax. I'm going to let you have some peace. Amen. Take my yoke or, or work with me and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, I tell you, I, I, I challenge you to find that in religion. It's the opposite. It's all about what you do and how you do it and how well you do it. Amen? When it comes to grace, we don't need to work harder. We need to learn to rest harder. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 4, 1 through 5. Now, I know that, again, that's a contradiction. That's a, that's a paradox. But here's what he says about it. Let us therefore fear. Now, he's speaking about the Jews who wouldn't go into the promised land. So he says, let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. They had the gospel preached just in a different way. It was through signs and, and uh, signifying and so on and so forth. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he has said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from his work. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, praise the Lord. So in some weird way, in some strange way, it takes work to not work for God. which is why Hebrews puts this word out there, to labor, to enter into his rest. Why? Because it's the opposite of what humans normally would think. We, get to, we have pride in the fact that we have pulled ourselves up by our own bootstraps, right? Or we made this happen or we worked hard. Nothing wrong with that. I respect people that have done that. But God is saying the way it is in the kingdom is the opposite of this. It's about what I have done for you, not what you can do for me. So Paul continues telling the Romans that if, if Christians don't work and they trust in God who justifies the ungodly, then that faith is counted for them as righteousness. This is exactly what happened with Abraham. He was not righteous. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We know that by just read his, a little bit of his biography and you know that this guy's a failure. He's a flop when it comes to doing what God told him to do. But he believed God in spite of his failures. And God declared him righteous, the father of the righteous. Amen? So the minute we trust in Jesus, our standing becomes his standing. Amen? We don't represent ourselves anymore. Jesus represents us. Amen? Our faith isn't earned. It's counted. You don't earn it. God just counts your faith as righteousness. Even when we screw up, God looks at us and says... Pure, spotless, amen, holy, blameless, perfect, my kid. And that's what changes lives. You don't have to keep trying. You don't have to hide. You just have to trust in Jesus who exchanged himself for you. We just need to surrender our sin, surrender our guilt, surrender ourselves as God, and let God be God and every man a liar. He took our shame, he took our sin, he took our filth, so that God could be both just and the justifier for anyone and everyone who believe in Jesus Christ. He doesn't just let us off the hook. He put Jesus on the hook for us. John 19, verse 30. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it's finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. It's finished. And it's finished for you if you trust him because your faith is counted as righteousness. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures here from Hosea. I've used this uh, analogy, metaphor, parable, however you want to describe it, uh, before, but it's because it's so 
perfectly expresses the character and the goodness and the love of God. And so look at uh, Hosea chapter 1, verse 2. I'm just going to read a couple of scriptures here. Most of you probably know the story, but if you don't, I'll kind of give you a little history here while we go along. He says, the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, go take a wife of whoredoms. In other words, I want you to go marry the prostitute. And uh, I want you to have children with this prostitute. Because the land has committed great whoredom departing from the Lord. Okay? So, Hosea does it. He, he marries this woman by the name of Gomer, which should have been a dead giveaway, I can't imagine. Gomer. But nevertheless, he married her. And, and here in Hosea 3, verses 1 and 2, let's look at this quickly. Then said the Lord unto me, Get ye, go yet, love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel, who looked to other gods and loved flagons of wine. So I brought her to me for 15 pieces of silver and for an omer of barley and a half omer of barley. So here's the deal. Hosea marries Gomer, the prostitute. They have children. They name him, and I could go through all the symbolism and all that goes with that, but the point is this. He does what God told him. He goes and marries this whore. But it doesn't end there. She leaves him after she's had children with him, after they've been married, and she goes out back to prostitution, which is what he's talking about here, an adulteress, because she wasn't an adulteress before. She was just a whore. Praise the Lord. Now she's a whore. That's also an adulteress. This is not a good thing. <laughs> Can you say amen? I mean, especially if you're Hosea. It's your wife. The mother of your children, right? And this is the same book where it says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. The lack of knowledge is not how much IQ we have. It's our understanding of God and our relationship with God. That's what they're referring to. And that's why it's in the book of Hosea. So, you know, it would make a great ending if after marrying Hosea, Gomer did a complete 180 and left her job. But see, unfaithfulness wasn't just an action for Gomer. It's a lifestyle. It's who she is. It's what she is. She continued to play the whore. And God wasn't trying to make Hosea miserable. He wasn't trying to just humiliate him in front of everybody else in the community. God wants us to see what it's like for God to pursue people, his own people, his own children. See, we're the spiritual whores because we give our lives to false gods. Money, sex, reputation, work, whatever. Pick a thing. We all got something. Several somethings, probably. But God continues to choose us. He continues to love us. He continues to woo us. Amen. He continues to choose us. And that's the God of the Bible. That is God. That is the true God that we serve. A God of pursuit. A God of covenant. A God of unfailing love and grace. Who never, 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 never gives up on us never stops loving us, never leaves us or forsakes us, never. Now, the story as a reflection of us isn't flattering for sure, but I love how it illustrates God's true nature. He doesn't just marry us once. He doesn't just come after us once. He doesn't even just save us once. I know once saved, always saved, which is true. But I'm talking about saved from our situations, our circumstances, our own poor choices, our own stupidity, our own anger, our own whatever it might be. Amen. He just keeps on saving. He is a savior. Praise the Lord. Praise God. He doesn't just make a promise. He is the promise. Praise the Lord. And he cannot lie. He cannot separate himself from his word. He and the word are one. He doesn't give up. He doesn't go away. He's relentless in his pursuit of us. I mean, I, I can remember thinking about heaven as a kid and being kind of freaked out by it, to be quite honest with you, because I'm thinking up there with all these really perfect people and a perfect God, that's not going to be comfortable. 
You know, where am I going to go hide to do this stuff I do? You know? There's no hiding. But God's trying to get us to understand he embraces us with all of this junk. He loves us with an unconditional love, a love that we just can't get past and can't quite comprehend. And if we could, and if we ever do, I'm telling you, it will be like a ton has been lifted off of your shoulders. Life will be sweet. Life will be enjoyable. Life will be fun. Life will be a blessing. Because you're not having to look over your shoulder constantly. You're not having to re-evaluate yourself every five minutes and everybody else around you. You can be forgiven and you can forgive them. Amen? His love. I mean, his love isn't soft and fuzzy. It's ferocious. It's furious. It's jealous. We run. We rebel. We turn away. But Jesus is always right there with his arms open wide. He's always the father of the prodigal. How many prodigal trips we've made down that road in our life, you know, in one day. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 6, verse 18 and 19. We ought to be the happiest, most fulfilled people in the world. With all of our crap, because we've got it too, we're in the world, and, and because of that we're subject to some of the junk that's in the world. We're not of the world, but we are in it, and th therefore we have tribulations, we have sickness to deal with, we have financial th things, we have people, we have all of those relationships and everything else, we have all of that. But in all of those things, we are more than conquerors. Amen? It's all, it's all what Tim was talking about up here. It's all that we were singing about in, in the preliminaries. This is the God, and what God wants more than anything else is for us to understand the whole book of Hosea. Read it and think to yourself, who, what natural, normal person could deal with that? Who, what normal human being could live that kind of rebellion, that kind of rejection, that kind of humiliation, and keep coming back? And God says, that's how I am. That's me. That's what I am. And that's who you are to me. Two, by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, or into the presence of God. Amen? In Jesus, we have an anchor. He secures us to God. There's no breaking away. It's no anchors away. That anchor isn't going to be lifted. It's not going to be pulled out. It's, not, it's, it's too much. Praise the Lord. We've been bought, and God's love is so potent that we can't break that. We can't do anything to cause him to not love us. I mean, as I said, religiously, God is portrayed as the ultimate judge waiting to sentence us for our sins. And the truth is, he's a loving husband who compels us with his love, not his fear. Both, you know, fear and love can be motivators for sure. It can cause you to be obedient. I remember as a kid, my, my dad was a real disciplinarian. And the fact that we were adopted made it even more kind of Frightening because I'm, you know, you're never quite sure. And, and he stuck with me, but he didn't really. He's, I'm not really his. You know what I'm saying? You're looking for excuses, but the truth is, uh, he was a disciplinarian. He wasn't, or by today's standard, he might be a child abuser. But you know, in the 50s, normal behavior. That's what they did. You act up, you get a stick. You know, you get swatted on the rear end. You get a spanking. You get a belt, maybe if it's really bad stuff. But I mean, that didn't make me think that he was evil. It just meant. That's dead. You don't do stuff that you know you shouldn't do because there's going to be consequences for it. Amen. And I'm sure that's what he was trying to teach was that, you know, eventually you're going to grow up and be an adult and there's consequences for your behavior. You go out here and run over somebody, you're probably going to jail, rob a liquor store. There's consequences, you know, shoot somebody. There's consequences for this stuff. So that's what he was trying to accomplish. Amen. But so fear and love can both be motivators in terms of obedience. But only love causes joy. And I can speak from personal experience. Fear says do it and you're in big trouble. 
And that's the trouble with fear-based Christianity. We only obey when we have fear. When fear is present. Yeah. You know, if you only want God when you feel threatened, it's not God that you're worshiping, it's fear that you're worshiping. God's grace is so much more powerful as a motivator than fear is. See, love is the deepest motivator. If you're motivated by fear, by rules, by anger, or some other emotion, it only lasts while that emotion is there. Love is a state of the heart. Anybody married any length of time knows you may have fallen into love, right? But it's not accidental after a while. It has to be a choice. Am I right? I mean, stuff happens to make you not feel madly in love like you did on your honeymoon, maybe, or, you know, while you were dating. Life gets in the way, and real stuff happens, and real things... So you have made a decision to love. This is what David said about the Lord. He said, I will love the Lord my God. In other words, I'm, I'm making a choice here. I will. I'm willing to love the Lord because that's what I need to do. That's what I have to do. And in relationships, I'm not saying you're not still in love with your spouse. I'm just saying there are many times when you have to make the choice to love when you don't like. Right? It's, it's no longer just an emotion. Now it's a, it's a state of being. It's a state of the way you think and the way you operate. And you can't be in a relationship for any length of time without that coming up. Exactly. Right? I mean, that's why we have the divorce rate we have and all the other stuff that goes on with it. But I'm just saying, and I know because I've been there and done that and the whole thing. I'm just saying real love, though, is more than an emotion. It may start out that way, but it can't stay that way and be successful. You have to get past just the emotion of it and into the state of mind or the state of the heart that just says, I'm, I love this person, I'm committed, I'm, I'm, I'm devoted, I have to, I can't, there's no other way out, there's no other thing to do. You don't get to just pick and choose, right? So, the emotion or the, 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 the feeling will only last as long as the emotion is there. And true love, it goes on after the emotion is no longer there. Or when the emotion rises and falls, real love just continues on in spite of the emotion. You may not always feel emotional about it, right? I mean, but you can still be in love, right? The emotion's great. We love the emotion. That's what makes the world go around and populates the earth and everything else. But sometimes you don't feel that, right? But you still love. Because it isn't just in that moment. It isn't just in that emotion. It's a lifestyle. It's a choice that we make. And that's what God is saying about him. This is how God is. Is he always emotional? Is he always, you know, like with the grandkids and you're hugging and kissing? Maybe not. But the love never changes. He's committed. He's totally 100% in. Look, I got to say, God is not Hosea. But he's trying to show us something. You got to know when Ho when Hosea was told after he married her and they had children and then she went back to prostitution and he was told to go down to the chopping or the selling block the the tra where they traded in slaves and prostitutes where they were sold go down there and buy her back. Now I'm telling you that would be a hard pill to swallow, Amen. and I've got to figure that Hosea probably wasn't really into this thing emotionally. It was a decision he made because God told him, this is what I, got, I have. I, I got to show this. I have, people, I have to see this. And so he did. He went down and did. Because that's the nature of God. Now, is God overwhelmingly giddy about our stupidity and our bad behavior? No, but he doesn't stop loving us. He doesn't stop coming after us. He doesn't give up on us. He still loves us like a mother loves a child, like a, a parent loves a child. Yes, we, we see that the choices they make, and they, they upset us, not because, because it's necessarily a bad thing or an ugly thing. It's because the consequences could be bad for the kid, for the child, for the whatever. And that's God. That's what God is. He's not saying, I hate you because you made that choice. No, he's saying, I, I hate it that the consequences can come to you as a result of that choice. Because we're in a world where there are consequences. Amen? 
So Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verses 3 through 7. Praise the Lord, I'll try to move along here. And there's more to this, and that's the point I want to get to at the end. There's more to this than us just going, this is so good that God loves me. I feel it. I don't feel it. Praise the Lord. There's something that he's, he's trying to get us to some place that he knows we can only get to because of love. Fear won't get us there. Intimidation won't get you there. It's love and acceptance that will get us there. If we're going to ever operate in the last days as the way the church is supposed to, we're going to have to get to the place where we are confident in God's love and acceptance. Amen. Even when we screw up, even when we fail, that God's not, you know, abandoning us and leaving us to our own devices. We have to get to the place where we realize it's through this acceptance of his love and the lack of work for righteousness, but just ex receiving it as a gift of grace that will allow us to step out in faith and do the things that that first century church did. Yeah. You can't do it under condemnation. You can't do it in guilt. If you could, it would have happened by now because we've had 2,000 years of that kind of religion and it hasn't changed a thing. I mean, yes, we, we may understand some more things about God, but we're not doing the things in a consistent way that God declares we are to do. So, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Amen? One of my favorite things about the grace of God is that whenever you see it in Scripture, you don't see it demand some sort of action as a payback. I mean, there isn't like, here's my grace now. Now, we've read it that way a lot of times because of religion, but that's not what they're saying. That's not what he's saying. He's saying because he has accepted us, and he accepted us one way, by grace, because of the act that Jesus performed on our behalf 2,000 years ago. Amen? Amen. It's, it's a one-way type of love that runs the conduit from God's heart to ours with no interruptions, just that kind of grace is outrageous. It's, it's, it flows. It just flows from God to us. Amen? So a lot of religious-minded people, and you see it all the time, read it. See it on TV, hear it on the radio, different uh, Christian programming that say, well, that kind of thing, you know, what's going to happen with grace is uh, you'll end up with anarchy. People just going crazy and doing everything and anything they want to. And I just say, uh, yep, you can take advantage of it. You can, or it wouldn't be grace. Praise the Lord. Amen. The truth is you can take advantage of it. That's what makes it grace. To, 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 to try to dumb it down and to try to religiousize it some way is a slap in the face to God. Yet now we're putting the thing back on ourselves. Yeah. That's what makes it so outrageous. Yeah. True grace cannot be controlled. It can't be tamed. It can't be used by religion to manipulate people. Praise the Lord. It's wild. And we have to trust it will do the job that God wants it to do. It may take longer. Longer than what? Longer than the nose to the grindstone stuff that turns everybody into hypocrites? Like, you know, I'm really good because I've done this thing and I've done that thing and you haven't, so you're not as good as me and I get to judge you now and anybody else and everybody else. When in fact, in my deepest, darkest, private moments, I know I'm as big a failure as anybody else is because Jesus said, if you're just thinking about this stuff, you might as well do it because you're already held accountable for it under the law. Amen. And I've done most of it. And what few things I didn't do, I certainly thought about it. And the only thing that kept me from it was the consequences. Praise the Lord. See, true grace, real grace loves us just as we are, right where we are. 
with all of our mess, with all of our stuff. Amen. But it loves us too much to keep us there. It won't keep us there the way religion keeps you there. It frees you, amen, to not have to worry about the consequences as far as God's concerned so that we can then love God and begin to develop a relationship with Him that is based on love and not on fear, on, on grace and not on works. You understand what I'm saying? Because most of us, as much as we know that we know about grace, they're still in the deep, dark, subterranean parts of our being. There's this anxiety. There's this questioning because we don't have any, any other kind of thing that parallels this love, this, this commitment, this grace. We, we don't experience it in any other part of life. And so it's difficult. That's why, that's why we preach it over and over. That's why we talk about it over and over because we really have to have our minds renewed. In our hearts, yes, we believe and we understand, but trying to make that transition from a feeling, from a heartfelt faith action into actually living that out is difficult because we don't have any other examples. We don't have anything else to support this but God and His Word. Praise the Lord. We need rescuing. And God does exactly that. And He does it no charge. Amen. It's life-giving. It's life-transforming. For God so loved that He gave. His grace is sufficient. His strength is made perfect in my weakness. His strength is love. It's not the power of the right hand. It's the love of God where His strength really resides. Colossians 1, uh, verses 9 through 14. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Romans 5, 17 through 21. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense. Now think about reigning in life. How do you reign in life? Who reigns? Kings reign. Kings who reign in their kingdom. How many of you know they got it made? <laughs> right? I mean, if you're a ruling monarch and you're reigning, you're on the throne in your kingdom, Whatever you ask, you get. Whatever you say has to be accomplished. Right? That's the way it works. And that's what he's telling us. If we understand this grace, we don't just eke out a, a, a life. Amen? We reign in life above the fray, above the stuff, above the mess, above the lies, above the sickness, above the disease, above the... Right? Yes. But it takes a, it takes a challenging of us for this to happen. And that's what God is doing. Amen? Amen? Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Now, either you believe that or you don't. Adam's sin, I didn't have to do anything, although I did plenty. But I didn't have to do anything other than to get born into the bloodline of humanity which made me an offspring of Adam, which means I carry his nature, his sin nature in me. Amen? Now, I did plenty to, you know, add to that during my life. But had I done nothing, I'd be a sinner. 
simply because of my birthright, my genealogy. Well, we get, that's why we have to be born again. That's why Jesus told the, 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 the man that came to him at night. He said, look, the guy's saying, what do I have to do? How am I supposed to do this? And, how, how? and Jesus said, you've got to be born again. You need another bloodline. You need a different DNA. You need a different genealogy if you're ever going to be able to operate in this. And he said, well, how can I go back, into, back to my mother's womb? I'm going to get born again. He said, no, you've got to be born of the water and the spirit. Baptized, acknowledging that your sins have, are washed away. Amen. And newness of life or the spirit life comes. That we're, we now have God's DNA. We had Adam's. But once we got born again, we now carry a whole different genetic code. And it's a God code. It's, it's a spirit code. Amen. And so moreover, the law entered that this offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Praise the Lord. John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world. This is the Lord. He said, now is the judgment of this world. And now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Or the de devil and his demonic influence, right? So if we are in Christ, our judgment is not in our future. It's in our past. Our judgment took place 2,000 years ago on the cross. And it's been dealt with. Amen. There's nothing more that can be done. Amen. It has been dealt with. I have been judged. I have been crucified with Christ. I was in Christ before the foundation of the world. And because of my faith, when he was crucified, I was crucified with him. And now I live. And yet it's not I that live, but Christ liveth in me. Amen. In other words... It isn't me that God's judging or, 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 or dealing with because he's already judged the one that I'm in. Praise the Lord. I've been judged in Christ. It's all done. It's all good. Amen. Genesis 22, verses 7 and 8. There's examples over and over and over and over in the Bible. God tells Abraham, he says, take your son, your only son, the one that he prayed for, the one that he pleaded for, the one that God said, I'm going to give you. And then God says, I want you to kill him. It's like Hosea again. It's God trying to show us his love for us. Willing to give his own son for us. Now look, here the, 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 it's kind of a contradiction in a sense. But he says, Isaac spake unto Abraham his father. And he said, Father. And he said, here am I, son. And he said, here's the fire. I get that. And, and there's the wood for it. But where's the lamb for the burnt offering? He knows there has to be a sacrifice. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Now, the story goes on. And as Abraham is about to put the knife to Isaac, a ram gets stuck in a thicket right next to him. And he looks over and he goes, ah, there's a ram. Well, a ram is a male lamb. It's a picture of Christ and his finished redemptive work. So we can see in this ram that's caught in the thicket, God's provision of a sacrifice. We are Isaac. Right? We're on the altar and, we're, and, and we know we deserve this. And God's letting us know that we deserve it. But I myself will provide a sacrifice or a lamb. Amen? And so... Isaac being uh, on the altar is our identification with the finished work of Jesus Christ. That we have been spared the punishment that we deserved because of the innocent lamb. Right? Our substitute. We are delivered and the lamb is slain. Praise God. See, here's what God is trying to get across to us. Let, let me let, look at this quickly. Romans chapter 1, 19 and 20. The importance of this understanding this isn't just so that we can go, whoa, praise the Lord, we can all get drunk this afternoon and get high and have a party and whatever. <laughs> I, we might. 
the Lord, but that's not the, that's not the point. The point is to get us to the place where we recognize this is not about our behavior anymore. It's about what he has done. That's the only way behaviors will ever change. And to be quite honest with you, some of the behaviors that we have, that the church or religion has condemned were never condemned by God in the first place. So that's a whole other story. But I'm just saying what God's trying to get us to understand is the only way to be the God children, to show that DNA, to show that genetic line is through grace. You'll never get there. You'll never get to that realization without it. So because that which may be known of man, or excuse me, that which may be known of God is manifest in them. Who's them? Us. Because that which may be known of God. In other words, how do you know God? The only way God can be known is if he manifests himself in somebody. Amen. For God hath showed it unto them by the Spirit, right? For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. How? By people who understand their acceptance in the beloved, right? Being understood by the things which are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. How, how is that? Because if I'm totally forgiven, you know what? I don't have a whole lot of time for judging other people. Right? That's why he says, as you judge, so shall you be judged. Now, he's not talking about him. He's not talking about him. He's already told us his judgment has already landed on Christ. He's talking about our own self-condemnation. Because the more I find fault with everybody else, the more deep down inside I realize, you know, you got some issues yourself, buddy. Right? And so then you, then you can get to this thing where you're trying to, always trying to find fault with everybody else because it makes you feel better about you. Because you know you've got crap. But you, it's easier to point it out to other people. You ever notice people that are always finding fault with everybody? These are the most insecure people in the world. Because they're aware of all of their insecurities and all their issues and all their stuff. And the only way they can deal with it is by pointing out yours. To get the attention off of them and onto somebody else. Well, Jesus did just the opposite. Amen? He said, I don't want to see your faults. Except right here on the cross. And they'll never come up again. I'll never bring them up again. You may. But I won't. Right? So, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. So what may be known of God is manifest in us. The invisible is seen in us, the visible. I'm gonna sh I I'll show you why. On the morning of the sixth day, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. All right? So God reaches down, he takes a lump of red clay. He takes a chunk of the earth. Amen? And he begins to shape this into his image and into his likeness. Hmm? He starts shaping his image, his likeness into this earth realm, into this lump of clay, right? So the first Adam was made from red clay of the earth. And because he was made of the red clay of the earth, he had access to the earth. God didn't have access because that's why he had to come as a man. He wasn't of the earth. So God takes something of the earth so that this thing will have access to the earth, this man, amen. But God wasn't through with him there. In a split second of time, God, who is a spirit, and no man has seen him, right? He's all spirit. He reaches down into the deepest realms of his spirit substance, and he breathes into Adam, and he connects the two realms. God and man, heaven and earth. Invisible and visible. Well, if that doesn't give you a goosebump or two, you're not listening to what I'm saying. Because that's who we are. That's what we are. That was the original intent, and that's what it still is. That's why we have to be born again. Right? Amen. See, the deal was, Adam was never perfect. He was just innocent. Because there weren't any rules. There weren't any laws. But the one. Don't eat the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. He broke that. And that knowledge of good and evil is what separated him from God. It made him basically his own God. Now he's judging what's right and what's wrong. What's good and what's bad. Before he was innocent. It's like a little kid. And you see the, these little ones running around up here. Well, Ivy's, she's like two. She's innocent. 
Now you get to Colt and Clint and Izzy. Still some innocence, but not so much. Why? Because they've lived enough to learn some wrong and right. Some acceptable and unacceptable behavior. So the way we deal with them would be different than the way we would deal with Ivy or Ileana or just a little tiny baby, right? Because they are innocent. That's what God wants us to have is innocence. Amen. Not the knowledge of good and evil, just innocence. Can you imagine the freedom? See, the reason little kids are so happy, because they're innocent. They don't know that they're doing wrong unless somebody tells them. Yes. Right? They're just, hey, it's all good. It's all fun. Everything I do, it's great. It's fun. That's how God wants us to live our lives. Innocent. Accepted in the beloved. So here you got Adam, and it's the spirit and the natural. Heaven and earth. Located in the same place. Praise the Lord. So much so that Adam was to the visible which is called earth, what God was to the invisible realm called the spirit or called heaven. That's what we're supposed to be. That's why he says, through the abundance of grace, you will reign in life. You'll rule in life like God rules in heaven. You'll rule on earth as God does in heaven. Do you believe that? I mean, are you... Look, Luke chapter 11, verse 2. Jesus is trying to open this stuff up to us even before his crucifixion, even before the law had been dealt with or been fulfilled. He was trying to open our understanding up to some things. So he said unto them, when you pray, say, Our Father which is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He said, let's get, get back to the original plan, which is heaven and earth Interface. They, they become one. Praise the Lord. Jesus, a man, went back to heaven. There's a physical man in heaven. Amen. Now, he's got a spiritual, uh, you know, a, a spiritual body, but it's a physical body. It's still a, it's still a natural body. It just doesn't function the way these do. But he's what you're going to see in heaven. Amen. When you pray. All right. So then look at Matthew chapter 16. Uh, verses 18 and 19. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Why did he say that? Because Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the manifestation of God in the earth. You are this connection between heaven and earth. You bring them together. You make heaven on earth, Right? And so that's what Peter's revelation was. You're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And so Peter says, and because you understand this, so this is talking to us, because you're getting this, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In other words, you're going to have authority in both realms. Amen. Why? Because of Jesus. And why does God have authority in both realms? Because of us. Because of the, bro the, you know, the brothers and sisters of Christ. Yes. The firstborn. Can you, are you seeing what I'm trying to get across here? This is, this is the big mystery. Christ in you, the hope of glory. In other words, heaven coming to earth, this interconnection, this back to the garden kind of thing, where God started the whole plan, where man and God were one together, heaven and earth were one together, invisible and visible realms coming together because it's only in that avenue or that arena can we operate in the earth the way God operates in heaven. Can't take authority if you don't know you've got authority. It's like the prince and the pauper, you know. If you're the, if you, could be the, you could be the prince, you could be the heir, but if you don't know it, you're still begging out in the street somewhere. That's the history of the church, to be quite honest with you. We've got a DNA that declares us to be the righteousness of God. It declares us to be holy, without blame, acceptable to God. His offspring. And we're still down here begging for humans to help us out. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Keys of heaven. Loose on earth, loosed in heaven. Bound on earth, bound in heaven. 
It's the gospel of grace. Praise the Lord. And the gospel of grace is the gospel. It isn't part of it. It isn't one. It is the gospel. Amen. It isn't just about how we get from here to heaven. It's how we get what's happening there to happen here. I mean, basically, the church, the religion has made it all about us getting there. And God said, it's not so much about you getting there. That's a done deal. It'll happen eventually. The thing is about getting that to here. That's why I need you here. If it was just about us getting to heaven, it'd do like my pastor used to say, and whenever we got baptized, he'd, they just drowned us. Just hold you under. Amen. And you'd go to heaven. But we don't do that. We come up. And we have Christ's life now living in us. Why? So that we can bring heaven to earth. Not so that we can get to heaven. So that we can get heaven down here. Yes. It's about God connecting and rejoining heaven and earth. Giving us access through that one man, Jesus. Jesus Christ. It's about having access to heaven's supply. To heaven's resources to heaven's miracles by grace. We don't deserve it, but it's ours. Deserving's got nothing to do with it, you know? Anybody see the movie? Clint Eastwood? Guy's laying on the ground. I don't deserve this. I'm building a house. He said, deserving's got nothing to do with it. Boom! <laughs> kind of a flip on the story of Jesus, but... You get my point. Second Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Now he says... According as His divine power hath given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That word is godlikeness. Everything that is ours because, amen, that pertains to life, to natural, to physical, and to spiritual. Right? Because we're both. God's original intention was to live, for us to live in a quote unquote paradise no rules no regulations no stipulations just a loving relationship with him the one who would be our everything our source our supply something he would provide for every need that we have spiritual and physical natural and supernatural So the serpent, that's what his intention was originally. So it hasn't changed. God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His, he hasn't come up with a backup plan or plan B. This is the same plan. Amen? So it's no wonder the, the serpent deceived them. Why? Because, hey, if these people start acting like God on earth, I got problems. I got kicked out of heaven. I could get kicked out of earth. The same thing could happen to me here that happened to me there if these people ever get a clue. That they can resist me and cause me to flee. So that's why, 2 Corinthians 11.3, that's why Paul was concerned. 2 Corinthians 11.3. I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. It's like Tim said. Look, I believe in doctrines. I, I mean, I believe in theology to a certain extent. But that isn't what saves you. You can hear all the stories about the Roman road and the different uh, uh, philosophies and theories and, and, and so on and so forth and when it comes to religion. But if you don't know Jesus, I don't care what you know. You're, you're, you're as good as a heathen. You're no better off. Praise the Lord. So he's telling us, look, my concern is that you, this thing is going to turn into a religious thing. And the next thing you know, the simplicity of what it's about, which is just you believing in Jesus and Jesus giving his life for you, is going to get lost in the mess. 
And we're going to end up with what we've had for 2,000 years, and that is a ch church that is basically weak and anemic and inconsistent. Now, we have miracles and things happen occasionally, but not on the level that it should be happening, not the way that they should happen for each and every one of us, not just for the big-name superstar preacher or evangelist or what have you, or some big ministry. We ought to be doing the same things ourselves, personally, individually. So Paul was concerned that we would move away from the simplicity that's in Christ and his finished work, amen, to some other gospel which is not another gospel, he said. It's really not another gospel. It's just an imitation. So it was the, this other gospel that he's talking about was the leaven of the Pharisees. In other words, it was a mixture of law and grace that comes from them as though they were messengers of light and righteousness, the scripture says. Be deceived by these messengers of light and righteousness. But their message of righteousness was an old covenant righteousness based on the knowledge of good and evil. Praise the Lord. Are you with me? Am I making any sense? Praise the Lord. The new covenant righteousness is based on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and is given to believers free. It's a gift. Because of the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, we reign in life. Innocent. Like God's little children. That's why he says, call me Abba. Call me Daddy. Because I see you as innocent children. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15. About done here, praise the Lord. This will be the last scripture. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. He said, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel... For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. In other words, he's saying these people are doing the same thing Satan did in the garden. They're trying to get you to focus on good and evil, and I'm trying to get you to understand you're innocent. He's trying to steal your innocence. He's trying to rob you of your innocence and give you a consciousness of good and evil so that condemnation can come. You can't be condemned if you don't know that it's wrong. That's why he says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8 and 1. So for such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And it's no marvel, it's no big surprise, because Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. He had Eve believing that he had this great wisdom that he was going to share with him. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Now, get this. What's their end going to be? Is God going to, what's God going to do to these people who are deceivers? Their works will find them out. In other words, they're going to be judged by their works. Why? Because they're not trusting in grace. You're either in works or you're in grace. Paul said, those that don't work, the ungodly, are justified because they're not working. Because they're resting in what Christ has done in the finished work. So Adam was placed in the middle of the finished work. And, right, everything was done. Everything was good. Right? It was all finished. He just, I mean, God didn't put him there first to, to work a bunch of stuff up. He did it all, finished it all, and then he puts Adam in there. So Adam is placed in the middle of the finished work, and he was told to guard it and to keep it. That's all. Just don't let this thing change. Just keep it the way it is. Stay innocent, and all your needs will be provided. Everything that you have need of will be taken. <clears throat> Take dominion. Replenish the earth with heaven. And we've been given the same dominion mandate because God doesn't change. The purpose and the plan is still for man created in God's image and likeness to fill the earth with heaven's influence and heaven's resources. Amen. For us, the kingdom of God is God's influence. It's the favor of God. It's God's resources. And the reality is that's now in us. Praise the Lord. We're full of God's purpose and potential. It's a present reality in each one of our lives right now. And it has been for 2,000 years. And it's all because of God's love 
and this outrageous grace to the ungodly. He calls his own, the scripture says. How does he know them? Because we were made in his image and after his likeness. And he does it by grace. Praise the Lord. It's been a weird service, you know. I mean, it was kind of somber, and or am I just imagining that? I thought it was kind of weird starting out. I mean, not weird in a spooky way, just unusual. I think God's just serious about this. Not grim, you know what I mean? Not, not depressing. He's just serious. He wants us to realize, look, man, you don't realize how good you've got it. I want to see my children enjoying life. I want to see them experiencing the good things, the, the joy, the, the freedom of no fear and no guilt and no shame and knowing that they're loved, totally loved. You know, it's like uh, I, I want, I know that, that sometimes there's reasonable conjecture on this, but when my kids or grandkids or great-grandkids come to my house, I don't want them to feel like they have to say, can I please have a drink? Can I please have a cookie? I want them to just, there's the refrigerator. If you're big enough to open the door and get it without dumping it all over yourself, have at it. It's yours. It's yours. I mean, that's why we have it, right? The only reason I'm going to get it for you is because I don't want you to make a mess. But otherwise, yeah. That goes for everything about my truck. I just won't let him eat in the truck, praise the Lord. I just have my own little hang-ups. But you know what I'm saying? That's how God is for us. He wants us to feel like it's all yours. I mean, you know, it's just, you come to my house, and it's your house. It's, it's your stuff. It's, it's your goodies. It's your, right? You want him to feel like, man, it's fun to be there. You know? I, I try hard not to be, a, you know, judging and critiquing. Now, sometimes you've got to be careful because, you know, a baseball bat in the hand of a five-year-old can be dangerous, right? But, you know, otherwise it's just, hey, have fun. Don't hurt each other. Just have fun. And that's kind of God's way of talking to us. Have fun. Just don't hurt each other. You know, just don't hurt each other. Just have a good time and love each other. That's what he's telling us, and that's what we should be telling one another. It's all good. Just love each other. Extend the same grace to one another that God extends to us. And life will be better for everybody concerned. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap for you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God bless you. Thank you for your patience. Went a little long here this morning, but that's good. We'll be short next week because we've got soup to eat afterwards. So praise God. God bless you all. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Shake hands with one another. Tell them, you look like God. <laughs>